Where do we begin? The Galactic Senate, improved federations, better options for origin stories, and performance updates across the board. And that's just to name a few of the changes. This could be the best incarnation of Stellaris I've ever played. Hello, Legion. This is Hadrian. Thank you for being here. Let's play Stellaris Federations. Final Federation 2 is what we'll call this series. So where do we begin? If you're a new Stellaris player, I want you to know right off the bat that I am making this series for you. In a moment, I want to tell the story of the Earth Unified Republic before the year 2200 and show you the new version of the Unified Solar Republic that I created for this series. Then I'll of course go over the game setup and we'll get started. And here are some timestamps to help you jump ahead when you're ready. Normally though, when I begin a series in Stellaris, I do a kind of medium to deep dive into the latest free update and DLC release, which has been well received and is helpful for everyone, but it caters to more regular and experienced players of Stellaris. With the release of the Federation's expansion and 2.6 Vern update in March 2020, Stellaris has received a long-anticipated diplomacy expansion, among other important additions you see here. And as I began to play it, thanks as always by the way to the amazing people at Paradox for sending me a preview build, I realized there's never been a better time to be a new Stellaris player. So it took some extra time after release. I've been playing a few games, getting acquainted with new mechanics so I can feel comfortable explaining them, and I'm going to be approaching this series as though playing for complete newcomers. Final Federation 2 won't be a tutorial series, as I'm still learning the intricacies of the new systems myself, but think of it as a more casual, easy listening, learn as we play series. Let me just say one thing specifically before I get going. As a longtime content creator for Stellaris, I have to tip my hat to Paradox for their recent work on performance improvements. Prior to Federation's release, developers and players had shared concerns about performance crawl, particularly in the late game. To address this issue, Paradox actually expanded the development team with new members in order to devote resources and talent exclusively to the game's performance. And the 2.6 Vern update contains the first implementation of the results. The difference is noticeable. As a Stellaris player, I want to say thank you to the team for their hard work and their dedication. Much love and respect. Now, when deciding which empire I would play as for the Final Federation 2 series, I've been completely on the fence for the past couple of days and mainly because I have verbally committed to two different things with regard to this series. In a recent channel update, I mentioned playing as the Unified Solar Republic, which is traditional. Every Federation series I've done on the channel, both Federation and Final Federation, has featured the Unified Solar Republic. And I did mention that I have updated the Unified Solar Republic, which we'll go over in just a moment. But there's also the possibility, which I mentioned a while back, when people saw that the Lithoids content pack had come out, there was some curiosity about what I would be doing there, and I said, well, we've got the Federation stuff around the corner, so why don't I kill two birds with one stone and play those together? And so I had said that I was going to do that as well. But I've been so on the fence, because I enjoy playing as both, that I just put it to a poll last night to see what people thought. And for a while, it was really close. It was neck and neck, not just when it was a few votes, but after 100 votes, close to 200 votes, it was like 50-50. But then once it started getting above 300, 400, humanity started to kind of pull away, which is indicative of, I think, kind of the slight favor of playing as a more vanilla Stellaris Empire right now. Maybe there's a lot of Lithoid content out there. I don't know, but I'm going to just go with the preference on that one since a clear preference did develop. Let's go ahead and start a new game. And as I mentioned, I'm going to go through this in a bit more detail than I typically do because I would like those of you who are new to Stellaris to know a little bit more about what you can do to customize your game starts, including customizing your empires in Stellaris. So first of all, let me read the biography, the backstory of the Unified Solar Republic so that you have a little bit more information on how we're beginning. In the early years of the 22nd century, humankind stood on the brink of annihilation. Catastrophic shifts in the Earth's oceans, atmosphere, and climate, coupled with a pair of ominously powerful geomagnetic calamities, brought the world of the 21st century to its knees, and then broke them. The few powerful city-states that remained banded together forging a last-ditch technological alliance to curb nature's wrath, and at last began to reverse the tide of heat and death. At the dawn of the 23rd century, with the planet finally cooling and its population stabilizing, the Chancellor of the Earth Unified Republic reached anew for the stars, for we knew then that Earth would not forgive us twice. That's the backstory, and has been the backstory, for the Unified Solar Republic since the beginning of the series, and we're sticking with that. But there have been some updates that I will go ahead and show you. The first one you can see on the screen, we're using the humanoid 
class of ships now as opposed to the mammalian class of ships, which have been traditional for the Unified Solar Republic. And that's just because I feel like I've done a couple of series recently where you've seen those ships. I, I just kind of got that sense. And even when I was practicing for this and getting more familiar with Federation, I used the mammalian ships a lot and I wanted to switch things up. So let's jump in and take a look at what you can customize. So first of all, you can, of course, customize your portrait. There's a ton of options and different categories that you can choose from in order to make your race look the way that you want. And there are ways to change the look of the leader specifically, which we'll get to. The species name, you can set not only what the name is, but the plural and the adjective, and of course, set the biography as well. You can randomize that if you would like. Now, the names list, our ship prefix is NSS, and then we are using a set, which by the way, these are moddable, so there are lots of community-created mods that actually have additional names for leaders, ships, planets, fleet names. This is how you select a scheme that the game uses to automatically name things as you discover and create them. You can give them your own names. You can name planets, you can name ships, you can name leaders even, I think. I mean, you can I have I don't think I've ever changed the name of a leader, which is why I'm not sure of that, but I'm I'm almost positive you can. But the point is that these things have a scheme that they start with and you can select which one you're going with. So we are going with the United Nations of Earth. I think that's what UNE stands for. You can tell how often I play as them. I play as my custom empires. That's what I do. So we're going with that for the name lists. And then traits. This is where things start to get a little bit more into the strategy aspect of Stellaris. So you have a certain number of trait points and a certain number of trait picks. So you can definitely pick a certain number of traits and you can only do so up until your trait points are expended. So what this means is that you can select a handful of positive traits, usually just a few. But then if you want to add maybe another positive, you would have to counterbalance it with a negative, which is kind of what I have going on here, because adaptive, as you can see, is a more expensive trait. It uses two points. And so normally I wouldn't be able to do much else, but I was able to add nomadic as well, which as you can see, that's a pop growth bonus. Pop is population. So that helps our population grow more rapidly from immigration. So from people coming in from other worlds, we have a 15% boost and there's a 25% resettlement cost. So the cost of moving your populations from one planet to another in order to facilitate the growth of your, <laughs> in order to facilitate the growth of your colonies is decreased by the nomadic trait. And then they're adaptive, which makes every planet you could possibly settle 10% more habitable, which improves not only the happiness of the population, but also productivity as well, because happiness influences productivity. And then finally, wasteful is something, and by the way, <laughs> this is a basic human setup for Stellaris. Any human in the base game has this. So I kind of copied it. This isn't something that I selected specifically, but they are wasteful. So they use more consumer goods in terms of their general upkeep. And that is something that you can imagine you think about what consumer goods are that's well it's what it sounds like it's this it's just the general term for any kind of goods whether for sustenance or for well there's a food good for that but any kinds of things that you need in order to have a comfortable life think of them as almost like the things you need that you consume for comfort the things you buy maybe other than food that are necessary for your life all of those things are lumped into the category of consumer goods and we are currently wasteful so we use 10 percent more of them unfortunately so those are our traits for the unified solar republic and those can be changed through certain ways in the game so the name of our homeworld is obviously earth the name of our star system is soul and then we have the starting solar system which is the soul system. You can change this to use random, random trinary, random trinary, random binary, random binary. So there's different options. And of course the Deneb system, but I'm going to go with soul. And you can select from any number of different types within these three classes, dry, wet, or frozen. So you've got ocean, continental, or tropical for us. We're just going to go with the traditional continental world of earth. Evidently, we can start with an ocean world and still call it Earth. I don't know if it would look any different because it's supposed to be Earth, but we're just going to go with our continental start and call it Earth. City appearances. This just changes what that looks like whenever someone is interacting with you diplomatically. So you're going to see the screen whenever you talk to the Unified Solar Republic as a player and they are an AI. So if I met the Unified Solar Republic in my game, this is what I would see. That might not be this leader anymore unless it was the beginning of the game, but this is what you would see out of the window and you can change it by selecting different types. Origins. Okay, let me pause for a moment here because this is one of the new additions in Stellaris Federations. So 
we have prosperous unification as our origin. And that's the basic origin. You get a additional four pops population and two additional districts on our home world of Earth because we've had a stable planetary unification that has allowed the civilization to prosper and grow. Yay. But there are now a bunch of other options that we could choose from. Why am I not going with them as we begin? Because, again, I think to cater to people who are completely new to the game, I want to have a kind of vanilla experience, similar to what I did when Megacorp came out, because everyone wanted to play as Megacorp to a certain extent. And it's like, well, how much do these new mechanics just change the game for a normal empire, was kind of my question. And in a similar way, I want to go with Prosperous Unification. But there are lots of other options. There's Mechanist, Syncretic Evolution. By the way, I'm going to leave these tooltips up, but I won't go through all of these by actually talking about them. So feel free to just pause as I go through these tooltips if you want to read them. But there's Mechanist, Syncretic Evolution, Life Seeded, Post-Apocalyptic, which literally has you starting out on a tomb world, Remnants, Shattered Ring, Void Dwellers, Scion, which means you start as the vassal of a fallen empire, which is really freaking cool, Galactic Doorstep, Tree of Life, On the Shoulders of Giants, oh yes, I'm still scrolling down, Calamitous Birth, Resource consolidation, and yes, Calamitous Birth is mainly for Lithoid empires. You have to have Lithoid, as you can see at the bottom there. We don't meet that requirement, so you've got that nice big red X. And then Common Ground. So I considered doing Common Ground as a start, but I think I would prefer to do a more traditional Federation forming start where we go out and look for the people that we want to add to our empire, and to our Federation. Not to our empire, to our Federation. Because... Again, we want to see how the mechanics have changed based on the game that we're used to, but also from the perspective of a new player, this is what you're going to go with first. So we're going to see how the systems work before we go with any special customizing starts that give you bonuses. So as the common ground origin tooltip tells you, we can start as the leader of a federation with two additional members right away, which was interesting. I thought about it, but ultimately we are not going to go that particular route. And then finally, Hegemon, which is very similar to Common Ground, is just more authoritarian. And then Doomsday, which is one of the most popular ones in terms of what the community has been excited about because your civilization homeworld starts with a ticking time bomb and then blows up. And then you, you don't have a home planet anymore and you have to make do with whatever you can colonize before that thing blows up. So that's a lot of fun. And then finally, Lost Colony which should sound familiar to Battlestar Galactica fans, but regardless of whether you're a fan of that show, it's a really cool start. And also, I, I am going to be using it for some of my traditional races going forward. Whether I do that in another series featuring those guys on the channel, we'll see. But this definitely applies to some of the empires I've created in the past. So again, we're going to go with Prosperous Unification. That's what Origins are. They've replaced Origins in terms of the civics that you used to have to pick if you wanted to say that, for instance, you had a post-apocalyptic origin. So that's nice because you can have a post-apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic origin now, and you can still have a full slate of civics without having to waste one on just setting up a special origin. So that's one of the reasons this is particularly nice. But it's a much more robust and satisfying way, in a way that influences the way that the game plays out and who you might encounter in the game as well, which is really, really cool. For instance, the Lost Colony, if you didn't see this, an advanced empire of your species is spawned somewhere in the galaxy automatically, which is just wonderful. So let's go with government and ethics. Another more detailed screen. There's nothing really that's changed here apart from perhaps some tweaks to civics, but this is where you set up your government style for your planet. And there are lots of options depending on your ethics. You start with your ethics. And ethics are to be thought of as your kind of majority political sway. And what I mean by majority is that different population sectors, especially in large empires, can possess different ethics, especially if you don't go to certain lengths to control and influence the kind of unity of your population. So you can have warring factions, not literally warring unless you have an uprising, but you can have unrest on your worlds because people have different opinions and different ethics. So the ethics that you start out with are not necessarily the ethics your population will always follow. These are just the ones that the majority follows, and you have to take certain precautions throughout the game in order to ensure that it stays that way. So I made a slight change for this series. The Unified Solar Republic used to be fanatic, xenophile, and pacifist. 
They're still pacifist, which means empire sprawl from Pops is reduced by 15%, and there's more stability on all of their worlds. And Xenophile, which is an additional 10% trade value, and one additional envoy. Envoys are new as of this update. They're part of the free update and diplomacy polish that came out with Federations and 2.6 Vern. But Fanatic Xenophile is what we used to be. That gave additional trade value and two available envoys. The way that ethics work is you can either choose three from the inner ring or one from the inner ring and two from the outer ring if you would like the additional bonuses of one of the Fanatic options. Also, very importantly, you can also choose Gestalt Consciousness if you would like to go that route. And that is a single selection when it comes to that. It literally, you, you turn all these off and you become a Gestalt Consciousness. But, okay. I don't know why it's showing that as red. That's why. As you can see, you kind of start from the left and go to the right. So you have to go through this screen one at a time. That's what was causing that hitch just a moment ago with one of the uh, civics not allowing itself to be reselected after I made that change. Anyway, that was just for the purpose of demonstration. I have gone with these three this time, and we've added egalitarian, which means factions gain additional influence or help us gain additional influence is really the way you should read that. So the influence gained from a faction that is happy, and factions are all ethics-based. You can have factions belonging to different ethics gain additional influence. What influence means, I'll show you in the game. Specialist pop resource output is also improved by 5%. So any of your populations that have specialist jobs, which are not like first tier worker jobs, they're specialists. Obviously they're more educated. They work in more important, more productive jobs in terms of the middle tier of the economy, which is really important for producing ships as well as uh, researching advanced technology and just maintaining a large robust empire. The Resources system in Stellaris has changed so much in the past year to year and a half, and it's been really impressive to see how much more in depth it is compared to how it used to be. It might be almost two years now since we've been using the different resources. I've almost lost track of time. But the egalitarian ethic is our new replacement for not being fanatic xenophile anymore. So we have these three. And then you pick your authority, and this is basically how often your elections are held. We could be corporate if we wanted to, but we're not. We're just going to go with our democratic authority, which makes us a moral democracy. This is determined by our ethics and our authority choice. It names us based on these things. It might also name it based on... No, doesn't name it based on civics, I don't believe. I might be wrong about that, but I believe moral democracy is determined, again, by these choices. And this is a government that is a pacifistic form of democracy, firmly guided by moralist principles and non-violence. So if I were to select, yeah, so we have direct democracy if we go with materialist ethics. So finally, we pick our civics. And these are two additional government bonuses that you can start with. You can add more later in the game or change them if you want to reform your government for a certain amount of influence. You can do that, that resource that I was telling you about. You can definitely do that. And we are an environmentalist, which goes just in line with the narrative from a moment ago as far as the backstory of the Unified Solar Republic. We are environmentalist, so our consumer goods upkeep is reduced by 10%. Now, I've talked about this before. Wait a minute, Hadrian, but your humans are showing that they're wasteful. So doesn't that cancel out? Yes, it does. That is there for a role-playing purpose. We will have the ability to remove that wastefulness and actually turn this into a bonus later in the game. So... Practically speaking, is this the best combination of traits for our race and civics for our government to start out with? No, but from a storytelling perspective, we are starting out as a vanilla human in Stellaris, and we have certain civics in place to offset the flaws of the vanilla humans without changing the vanilla humans in any kind of exploity ways. <laughs> so we are using this civic to offset the wastefulness penalty, and then we can remove wastefulness later, and we actually get a bonus because we still have environmentalists, unless we reform our government and don't have environmentalists anymore. And then there's the parliamentary system, which means factions gain an additional, or they help us gain an additional 25% influence. That's the way to read that tooltip. It's not that factions gain more influence. Basically, the happier the faction is, the more they contribute to your influence pool growing more rapidly. So parliamentary system and egalitarianism, I'm looking forward to this change. I haven't even practiced a game with this change yet. I've been practicing with fanatic xenophile and pacifist still, and I made this change recently. So there's that. Advisor voice, we have all kinds of options. Boundless. We build. Whoa. Democracy. Knowledge. Discovery. Compassion. 
integrity, and hot tea. Yeah, tea, oh gray, hot, it's important. So we are going to go with the diplomat because that is the most fitting voice from this choice, I think. We could maybe Do go with egalitarian. Do not be afraid to exercise your individual right to free thought. Please take a moment now to practice. Mm, you're a little snarky. Knowledge. I think I'm going to go with the diplomat. Discovery. Okay. And of course, you can base it on your government. Democracy like that. Sure is. Hyperdrive primed. Oh. But we're going to go with that. And then finally, you can set your empire name. You can change the flag. You can change your ship appearance. We've gone with humanoid. This has been our traditional ship for the Unified Solar Republic. And finally, you can customize your ruler. Now, I did change Laura Andrews' appearance just a little bit, mainly just on account of the thumbnail. When I decided on an image that had kind of a fiery base, I was like, well, what if we change the appearance slightly? Just it was an artistic thing. Ignore me. But this is a slightly different appearance. But other than that, you can change the name of the ruler title for both the male and female variants. And we don't have heirs, so that's not a concern here. But if we were an imperial type of rule, then you would definitely be able to set the heir title. So whatever you want that to be called, you can change that. Change clothes, hairstyle, phenotypes. So this just changes the basic appearance of the person as you go through. So if there's different phenotypes of a given race, then you can roll with that or roll with whatever you'd prefer your first leader to look like. And of course, this is just the initial leader, Laura Andrews. She will be, and yes, Laura, by the way, is a slight nod to Battlestar Galactica. I'm a big fan. Just re-acknowledging that for the first time in a while. Um, but this will just be our first leader. We could have another one elected. We will have another one elected within a very short time of our game starting. So that being said, let's go ahead and jump into game setup. That took a little bit longer, but that's just on account of explaining the basics in terms of what is available to you in terms of customization. So we are going with a huge galaxy. We can set this down a little bit if we wanted to, but I'm confident in my rig's ability to do well in the late game. And especially with these performance tweaks, I want you guys to see how that looks. So we're gonna go with a huge galaxy two spiral arms, which is the same as the Milky Way, 10 to 20 AI empires. If we were to turn off randomize, it would set it at 15. So I thought 10 to 20 would be a nice, or 15 would be the default. But I thought 10 to 20 would be a nice way to kind of let there be a little bit more unpredictability. We're also having one to three advanced AI starts. So you can think of these as like the Vulcans in Star Trek. Are there more advanced aliens already around at the beginning of the game? I typically avoid these. This time we're not going to. We're going to let one to three spawn somewhere in the galaxy. One to two fallen empires. So if two spawn, there's the possibility of a war in heaven, but there might not be. I didn't want to set two to three to whether it was more of a, not necessarily a guarantee. A war in heaven doesn't always start. If you've ever watched Babylon 5, that's where the inspiration for the war in heaven mechanics come. So you have two fallen empires that rise up at the end of a game and they might hate each other. <laughs> and if they do, then you're in trouble. So that might happen, it might not with our current settings. One to two Marauder Empires, which are basically like the organized barbarians. There are pirates in the game, but Marauders are like, think of them as barbarians as opposed to pirates. These guys are, they have their own kinds of organization, if you can call it that, and they can be paid to not only sack you and do damage to you and raid you and enslave your pops, but also you can pay them to go attack other people and mess with people. So one to two of them will spawn. I'm tempted to make that two to three, or you can't, it's only one to three. Let's stick with one to two. Then finally, we can set the tradition, cost, habitable worlds, primitive civilizations, and crisis strength from one X. These are just different multipliers for whether or not we want to change these different variables. Now, crisis strength, I normally go with like 1.25 or 1.5, but we are going with Commodore difficulty, which is two steps up from the default of Ensign. And as you can see, at Captain, there are already slight bonuses. At Commodore, the, moderses, the, the bonuses become moderate. So we are going to just keep our Crisis Strength at a reasonable 1x, because I haven't confronted an in-game Crisis on a regular basis in a long time, and I don't want to stress myself out. We're already playing on a high difficulty level, so the Crisis is going to be strong enough as is. And then the mid-game, end-game, and victory year, those are all just default settings. So by 2500, if we have the highest score, we will win. And then finally, we have the scaling difficulty turned off, which that's a newer setting, but if you aren't familiar with this, that's what it is. When this is enabled, any AI bonuses from the difficulty settings scale up over time, starting at zero and reaching a maximum at the end game start year. And then AI aggressiveness is normal. Empire placement is completely random. I can have them in clusters, but we're gonna go with random. Advanced neighbors are off. I don't wanna have anyone nearby that's particularly stronger with me, especially stronger than me, especially if they are, um, not friendly. 
I wouldn't want to deal with that. I've changed these slightly. We have only 0.5 abandoned gateways as opposed to 0.1, or as opposed to 1x, and then 0.75 wormhole pairs. Then two guaranteed habitable worlds nearby. And then finally, the Iron Man mode will be turned off because this is a let's play and I'm doing episodes and I need to be able to save when I need to save. So there's that. Not bad. Okay, so as a start, in terms of whenever I'm playing as an Earth-based empire, I like to kind of zoom out first thing and make sure that we're in a reasonably good position with regard to what we know about where the Earth actually is in the Milky Way galaxy. And this is pretty good. If we start out towards the middle, that's where I have a tendency to re-roll. But this is not a bad start, so we're going to go ahead and roll with that. Now, lots to discuss but the very first thing, there are a number of things you need to do when you're starting a new game of Stellaris. And I'm just going to start with the most obvious, which is these urgent notifications up on the screen showing that there is a physics, society, and engineering research project available to us. So what do we have? We have, first of all, for our physics researcher, we have Vlada Dvardovskaya. I hope I pronounced that somewhat right. And that's... We have three different options for her. There's a physics research boost here. I'll explain the option in just a moment. We have Beatrice Emerson... Okay, good, we have that there too for our society researcher. And she has the statecraft expertise, so projects like this will be a little bit faster for her because there's a match. Uh, Vlada's bonus is generalized. She has a 10% research speed bonus, and it looks like Olga has a 5% research speed bonus. She's our engineering researcher. And good, we have our basic introductory boosts. These are cheap, and they give a 20% boost to the research generated by research workers. And those are on planets, generally speaking. So these are... Not the people that work out on orbital platforms that generate research, but the, the people who are working research jobs on planets will generate more research. So let's choose those initially. One thing I'll point out is that when you're choosing research in Stellaris, it's like being dealt cards and you pick one and it's completely randomized each time. Some stuff will always show up earlier. Some stuff will always show up later. But in general, you will never have two games of Stellaris in terms of your research progress that are exactly alike. And that's a very good thing, because it just generally keeps things more interesting and kind of keeps your opponents, especially if you're playing against other humans, on their toes. Because no one quite knows who's getting to which research options first. And of course, like any good card game, you can play your cards right and do things that enable you to have more options, that enable you to research faster. And there are all kinds of ways you can play this particular system in order to gain some advantages over your opponents, human or otherwise, in the research game. So I'm just going to go again with the physics research boost. It's saying 87, 95, and 91 months. We're at January 1st, 2200, but it will probably not take that long. We'll get some boosts as we begin to survey the area around us that will help us. Let's go ahead and take a peek into the solar system, shall we? So here's the solar system. Here's Earth, Luna, and or the moon, if you want to <laughs> call it what we all call it. And then looks like we have a little bit of opportunity for engineering research on Titan. We can gather some energy credits from Saturn. More engineering research on Uranus. Okay. Tell you what, let's go ahead and build a mining station on Saturn. So now that we've set up our research options, generally speaking, the next thing that I do, there's a bunch of things, again, that you have to do at the beginning of any given game of Stellaris. I'm going to hit F9 and pull up the ship designer. Now, I'm going to turn off auto-generate designs, and I'm also going to go ahead and generate a slightly cooler name. Hartman, we'll go with. Let's get rid of the Bovington. And we're going to stick with everything on the ship for now because we don't have anything better. I'm also going to generate a new name here. Olympus Mons is a bit too fancy. Let's go with Pembroke. All right. So there's that. So we've just turned off auto-generating. You can leave it on if you'd like, and the game will auto-generate all of your ships for you, and you can build them. But this allows me to customize how my ships are set up. With auto-upgrade turned on, which I will now do. No, no. Go away. Pembroke. There we go. I thought I turned that on. With auto-upgrade auto turned on, as we get better mass drivers and lasers and reactors and systems, radar systems and combat computers and armor, and shields. Better everything of our various things that are equipped to our ships and to our defense platforms, 
it will automatically add those in the blueprints and the ships will give you an option in the field to upgrade. As you can see, the first fleet is already doing because I've made some changes. So that one's set to auto upgrade. Good. I'm just going to leave it like that for now. That's an initial step. We'll play with that more when there are actually customizations to be made. Then I'm going to hit F10 to pull up the fleet manager and I do want to go ahead and order some more Corvettes. So for now, we're just building one in the Soul Station by clicking the Reinforce Fleet button. I have said that ultimately I want five to be in the first fleet, which is a good round number to have. And it's not, I will say, it's actually not as important that I do that as it used to be. One of the first reasons back when, this is at least a couple years old as a piece of advice now, but one of the reasons you would build those ships as soon as possible and have five as opposed to three is that early game pirates were almost always a threat in Stellaris. Not so much anymore. Piracy works differently now. But it's still a good thing to do just in case you run into an early aggressor, like an actual unfriendly neighboring empire, which that's also completely random. We don't know how many there are. We don't know where they are. Right now, the entire galaxy is before us. So let's go ahead. I use, for science ships, a somewhat unusual approach. This is going to be a little bit more of an advanced tip, but... I've selected the move button, and now I'm just shift-clicking each of the systems that are connected to Sol by one jump. Now, this is just going to explore them, not survey them. So what that means is that I'm just going to travel to them and keep going. But as the ship moves around, we're going to unpause in a moment and let the science ship actually move, I will keep an eye out for any systems that have a planet in them, a habitable planet in them, because they'll most likely all have planets, or at least asteroids. But once we find habitable worlds, there are at least two habitable worlds, because remember, we guaranteed them, and they're nearby. So once I see them, I will order the science ship to survey that system first. And this is a way for me to find them relatively quickly, rather than just waiting for one to appear. And then finally, another thing we can do is go ahead and look at our capital. This icon means that there are building slots available, and we don't have the minerals right now. We're making 26 per month, so we're going to unpause momentarily, and we'll get there. And then we'll make some choices about what to build in these slots. But for now, it looks like we have, of course, our planetary administration capital building. We have administrative offices. We have research labs. We have alloy foundries. And we have civilian industries on Earth. We also have various districts which are just used to maintain the most basic components of the planetary and empire economy. So city districts provide housing and also trade value and amenities. But their, pri their primary function is their city buildings. They give your population room if you have a bustling population on a planet, you're going to have a number of city districts. And then we have generator districts, which generate energy. We have mining districts, which generate minerals. And we have agriculture districts, which generate food. And you can mouse over these to see exactly how they work. But these are the basic resources of the game. Stellaris for a while now. I'm going to go ahead and go to speed two and let that ship start moving. And we're going to watch as I talk. But Stellaris for a while now has had what you might call a two-stage economy. And maybe even more than two stages if you really want to think about some of the advanced stuff that you can do. But what that means is that you produce basic resources like minerals and energy and food in order to produce more advanced resources in the mid and late game. And in the early game too. For instance, alloys are produced by our... We already have alloy foundries and we also have civilian industries. These are producing consumer goods from minerals. These are producing alloys from minerals. So some of those... You can see that 24 of our minerals per month are being consumed. Half of the minerals we're making, roughly half, are being consumed by that second stage resource. So we need alloys to make ships, and we need those consumer goods, which I mentioned earlier. Construction completed. Just to generally make sure people have their toilet paper. Yeah, I said it. I said it, I'm sorry. All right, let's go ahead <laughs> and build that mining station now. I don't know how I didn't spot that earlier. Where's the mining station? Oh, it's over on Triton. Okay. Yeah, if I'd seen that earlier, I would have built that first. But it's okay. It can be good. It depends on how you feel, which if you have a choice in the very early game between building an energy station versus a mineral station, I mean, you need energy. All of station, all stations, all buildings, anything you can build in the game has energy upkeep. So you need energy in order to support your empire. And then you need minerals in order to build things. So it's really very similar. And why? What the heck? I gave you orders, didn't I? I must have hit something and canceled them. I was like, why aren't you moving? I'm waiting for that ship to move. I've been talking. 
Not sure why that canceled, but now they're going. I'll have to go, I'll have to go back and watch this later and be like, why in the world did I click? I know I clicked. I remember it happening. I didn't dream it. It was like 60 seconds ago. So the science ship is going to move from system to system now that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Construction completed. All right, very good. We need 200 minerals. And I'm going to go ahead and put... I'm going to hit F3 and pause too because, oh, we've already found a planet. Nice. Ooh, good start. Look at that in a moment. So I'm going to hit F3 to pull up the market and we are going to go ahead and transfer. Basically just going to transmute. <laughs> We're going to turn some energy into minerals. So just the smallest possible purchase. We don't have the money to make a larger purchase, but that way we have more minerals now. And I can go ahead and give the order to build these two research stations. So when you're zoomed out, it shows five total, but of course that's two different stations. So bear in mind, sometimes if you don't have quite enough minerals to build your platforms to gather the resources from a certain system, actually go into the system and you might find that you can build them individually for half the cost of what, or a third of the cost or whatever it is, depending on how many platforms there are. So there are two, there's Uranus again, and where's the other one? Titan. So thankfully we have enough for both. So I've given the order for the construction ship to build both. Now we don't have, well actually we do. I could buy again. And by doing that, I can make some basic decisions here. But we still don't have quite enough. We need 400 to really get to a point where we can make some decisions about what to put here. So we're going to hold off on that. I will give the order for the science ship to go ahead and survey the Serban system. Oh, nice. I want to take a moment as we begin here, because we're starting a new Stellara series. It's been a while since I've done one on the channel. I really want to appreciate... We're going to talk about the technical details of how to play the game. And we'll probably get going a little bit faster in the series later on. But like... As we go out into new star systems for the first time, I really want to look at them and I want to explore them and I want to feel like we're really branching out and getting to know the world as we, getting to know the universe as we branch out into it. So this is a class M star, beautiful red star. And then it looks like, oh wow, it's an ocean world with a ring. Cirebin two, it has 18 for planet size. That's the number of districts you can build. That's these things right here. So that's a pretty good size. It's actually larger than earth by two slots. So we've already found a planet a little bit bigger than Earth, habitable, it's ocean-based. So humans are, just to show you this really quickly, humans have a continental preference because it's based on their home world. So you can see that the habitability of the various other planet classes is influenced by that. We are 20% less acclimated to ocean worlds than we are to continental worlds. So we're not going to be as happy or productive on Serban 2, but that's still a nice find for our very first jump. And then otherwise... What I'm also liking is that look at the size of this system. There's a lot going on here. So this is probably going to be a resource-rich system, and it's right next door. And even better, you have to kind of get into our cluster to get to it. So it's pretty pretty well sequestered, which I like to see. Let's go ahead and go back to speed two. So again, I did a control shift click, or did I? Now we'll do it. Yeah. So whenever you want to move something to the front of the queue, I've given a bunch of move orders. You can see they're still there. But now the very first thing... Sanvi Nike is going to do good. She researches anomalies a little bit faster. She's going to survey this entire system, which is going to take her a minute. And since it's going to take her a minute, we're going to go ahead and build a second science ship so that we can be killing two birds with one stone. I will give the order. Oh, have I changed that yet? Yeah, we need to retrofit these. I've just opened up the fleet manager, which is again F10. And if we, all right, we've now said that we want these ships to be Hartman class instead of the class that we'd selected previously. And I can give the order to upgrade them, which will change all of them from the initial Bovington class that the game spawned for me into Hartman class, the one that I designed. We're going to stick on speed two for now, just so as not to let the game get away from me. I do like to play on speed three when I'm playing offline. And once the series has really Ship gotten going, applied. It's, all right, good. The first fleet's been fully repaired, so those ships have been retrofitted. They're all Hartman class now. We're still waiting on one more Corvette. We can hire an Admiral if we want. But yeah, I like to play on speed two in the beginning, just because when you start to get on speed three, especially once you do have multiple science ships out and about. Ah, the NSS Asimov. So we've got the NSF, NSS Azofi and the NSS Asimov. Beautiful namesake there, Asimov. So, um... Yeah, when, you, when you're when you on speed three, what I was saying is just that it, it, 
a lot can happen at once really quickly. Like you can have pop-up after pop-up after pop-up in the span of like five seconds sometimes, and it can get a little bit overwhelming. So let's see. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go with Darcy Brooks. I don't typically go for this, but these are research-based bonuses for when we actually assign someone to our technology research as opposed to being on a science ship. And I would really like just to spend as little as possible to get someone that's not in that category. So Darcy Brooks is now our researcher here. And we're going to send you... It's going to take the science ship longest to get over here. But you know what? This is such a big system. I'm still going to... give the same orders. I normally send my second science ship in like the opposite direction, but this is this is a massive system and Sanvi's going to be looking at that for a while. So, we will let that other science ship help her out. Let me also go ahead and build up oh, don't quite have enough yet, but I can fix that, right? Not quite. I'll just let them build up. You always have the option. This has been in the game for a while now to use your energy to buy these are basically credits they're called energy they're called credits energy credits <laughs> it's, it's your money and you can use it to purchase any number of things all right now i'm gonna go ahead and buy that which means i can build a second construction ship which will also come in handy what are you doing okay that's twice in one episode it hasn't happened in offline play i don't know what's going on maybe i'm just clicking something without realizing it while i'm talking but for God's sake. Evasive maneuvers. Oh, that was fast. What do we have? Science ship NSS Asimov has encountered a hostile hijacked fleet in Seoul and is currently attempting to evade them. Wait, in Seoul? Centuries ago, a group of radical priests and their devoted followers on Earth broke away from the established religions to form their own church. These extremists call themselves the Fellowship and have been responsible for many atrocities and acts of terror over the years. Although they have kept a low profile in modern times, we recently learned that many of their agents have infiltrated our military. These renegades have secretly been diverting resources to the construction of a small fleet of starships at a hidden facility on Earth. When their treachery was revealed, the cultists blasted into orbit on their ships and fled to Mercury. They must be stopped. So, we can begin the Fellowship Situation event chain. Log has been updated. Question is, how powerful are the ships? Ha! Not powerful enough. So, said the situation log's been updated. Cultist fleet. Yeah, they're right there. Okay, well, they, uh, they're they right in range of our orbital station and our four corvettes. Thank God we built that fourth one already, so that's going to help us win this fight. But that's an interesting beginning if I ever saw one. Before we unpause, though, let me take a quick look at what else I can build here. I'm going to go ahead and build an additional alloy foundry on Earth. Because I want to have... If we're going to be fighting early on against these guys or anyone else, I would like the ability to um, build as many ships as possible early on. All right. Our valiant space forces have skillfully disabled a ship in the Cultist Armada. It is mostly intact, and we are picking up faint life signs from inside its hull. Once we have eliminated all threats in the immediate vicinity, we should conduct a boarding operation to secure any survivors. They may be able to tell us more about the ultimate motives of the Fellowship. Prepare the breaching charges. So, Situation log has been updated. Now we have a... Right, so we, we need a military ship in orbit, which is fine, because I can just give the order. So I'm going to do that research project. Now for the umpteenth time... Are you still registering? The oh, it's a hijacked fleet. Tell you what, let's just set you to passive so that you'll do what I tell you to. That event, thinking about spawning, might have been what stopped this science ship from moving. Or maybe I did it. I don't know. But Okay, who will that research station, please? All right, so we have some trade value popping up already from one of the outer asteroids in Sirban. Not bad. All right, so this is almost done already. You know what, let me also go ahead and hire an admiral. What do we have? 
So we have a younger admiral that will increase FTL damage risk. So when you use your emergency FTL, when you basically say, retreat, go away, I don't want my ships to die. <laughs> It'll do your ships less damage when you do that. And then also there's a 25% combat disengagement chance. Combat disengagement is a mechanic they added a while back that when your ships are fighting and they drop below 50% health, there is a chance that they will either stay in the fight or try to run away and disengage. And if they disengage, they're no longer able to be killed, but they're also no longer participating in the active battle. So you don't lose them, but you lose their contribution to the fight. And there's a random chance. And what that does is if you have two fleets that are of equal size, or maybe one fleet that's slightly weaker than another, it introduces more of a possibility that a slightly weaker fleet, especially with stats that reduce that combat disengagement chance as opposed to increasing it, if you have a smaller fleet with a bunch of ships that are determined to stay and fight, it can beat a larger fleet with ships that are more likely to leave. And you have not only ways to boost your own combat disengagement or reduce it, but ways to boost or reduce your enemy's combat disengagement chance. So that's what that is. And then we have... Ooh, I like a speed boost. And then hull points and weapons damage. Yeah, let's just go with the traditional unyielding. That's a good... So this is exactly what I was talking about. This is an unyielding admiral which reduces the combat disengagement chance of the ships. Thuso Bancole is our first admiral. All right. So project has concluded. we've just gotten to Coggin, and we'll take a look at Coggin. It's a class K star. A little bit closer to the sun's color. Not quite as yellow. And it's a smaller system, but we're not going to survey that yet because there's no habitable worlds here. Looks like there's a barren world that could end up being a terraforming candidate, much like Mars. We can terraform Mars later in the game. That'll be fun. But then we have just a number of planets, none of which are habitable. Again, we might discover that some are terraformable later. But anyway, what's going on? Though the survivors offered sti stiff resistance, our boarding party was able to secure several prisoners from the disabled cultist starship. From them, we have learned that this conspiracy goes far deeper than we initially suspected. The agents of the Fellowship include several flag officers and high-ranking officials within our government. Mass arrests are being made on Earth, and all assets belonging to this cult have been seized. However, several of the starships they built in secret remain unaccounted for, and the upper echelons of the cult's leadership have vanished. We have picked up faint ion trails leading to several outlying systems. We must pursue these terrorists. Okay. So, so we have to search Sirban, Hadar, and Sirius. Sirius and Sirban will both be close. So it's these three systems here. That's not bad. I'll take it. So we're going to have to travel to Sirbin. Let's first heal up the fleet. I'm going to wait to build my fifth Corvette before I send them out looking. Okay, awesome. We've been building up a little bit of Unity month by month. Again, we are going for a research project right now that's going to speed that up. Or no, we're not, actually. I don't know why I thought we were. We were doing society research. Um, was that even an option, or did I go for... I'm thinking of a game I played yesterday. So, because we have reached our first threshold, which is 300, from our tradition screen, which is also something you can access by hitting F8, we can now pick our very first tradition. Now, because we're playing as the United Solar, or the Unified Solar Republic, we can go with the diplomacy tree now, which if we adopted this, we would get an additional 50% influence cost to our diplomatic or a 50% reduction to our diplomatic influence cost and our pop growth from immigration would increase by 10% but I'm going to do what I usually do and go with expansion first we're going to adopt expansion colony development speed will be increased by 25% just because I adopted that now roughly 24 months need to pass before we reach the next threshold which is 352 and we're making 14 per month so if you're new to Solaris Maybe a cog is already turning we in your mind. Detected an anomaly. Right, I'm going to leave that be for now because that's going to take a long time. Maybe a cog is already turning in your mind that, okay, whatever we need to do to produce more unity, I can do those things in order to get more traditions sooner. That's exactly how that works. But of course, traditions get more expensive the more of them you unlock. So it works both ways. Are you still not building that? Oh, okay. We're... Oh, it's being built by the other one. Never mind. The first fleet has been fully repaired. And are we almost to a point where I can? There we go. All right. Construction completed. All right, the Sayama system. Como Sayama? 
<laughs> I couldn't resist. Sayama System has a few planets in it. Massive Class M star at its center, but nothing habitable. So we're going to keep looking around the immediate ring surrounding the solar system. All right, the alloy founders are still being built on Earth. Again, that's going to convert some of our mineral surplus into alloy. So we're converting that to that. Not going to worry about that other slot yet. I will go ahead and send this construction ship to Sirbin, though. So that anomaly had a challenging rating. But as my scientists level up, they're gaining experience from... Oh, hello. We'll take a look at that in a moment. That's the Alpha Centauri system, too. Also, there's Barnard Star, which we'll visit. But as our scientists level up, they will be able to research anomalies faster. If you are a returning Stellaris player, anomalies have been updated such that you can never fail them. It's just that if you are not appropriate skill, they take forever. So you don't want to attempt very challenging anomalies with, say, level 1 scientists. Barnard Star is also quite a small system with... Uh, I don't even know what class star that is, but I'm guessing it's class M, just smaller. Now, Alpha Centauri, ooh, beautiful. So we have a trinary star system here. We've got a 15-slot, slightly smaller than Earth, world, and Alpha Centauri 3. And it looks like we have an Alpine world, 12-slot, Alpha Centauri 4. And then there are some barren worlds. This is, this is quite a rich system. There might even be a terraforming candidate in here. I don't want to get too excited because those are kind of rare. We already have one, again, in Mars, but I would be excited. Let me go ahead and give the order for my ship to survey Alpha Centauri. The sad thing is, Alpha Centauri is a minimum of three jumps away from Sol, because there's not a line between them. So it's going to take a little bit longer to get between worlds. And that's I can already tell you right now, this is going to be a piracy channel right here. We're going to have to put some stations with some hangars in place just to make sure that uh, piracy doesn't become too big of a problem. Okay, so since I found a good number of habitable worlds nearby, cultist marauders encountered. Yet another cultist fleet load of the Fellowship has been sighted in the Serpent System. Oh, because I sent my construction ship. All right. I'm going to go ahead and set you to group one. Now, where are you is the question. Now, hopefully they don't kill my science ship, but that might be what's about to happen. Evasive maneuvers. They might kill my science ship. All right, she got away. Oh, thank God. I would have been so annoyed. <laughs> I would have dealt with it, but... All right, so we're sending the first fleet to Sirbin. Uh, their, their order got canceled because... the cultist marauders were no longer in sensor range. But we're going to send them in to take care of those guys. Actually, wait. The, the battle rating of that fleet was 300, right? Ugh... Delay that. We're going to have to strengthen our fleet before we do anything. Tell you what, let's go ahead and design a second class of Corvette before we're done here. We're going to design a picket... Oh, uh, no. Missile boat class. Change my mind. On the fly. Nuclear missiles. And let's put a mass driver in the small slot. Armor in the middle. Shields on the outside. Auto upgrade. And we're, we're going to call you the... We'll go with Kodiak. So this is the Kodiak class. I could give it my own name too, but the, the random name generator is fairly useful in that regard. So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and add the Kodiak class to my fleet. So now I've given the order for there to be a total of 10 Corvettes in my initial fleet, and I need to build the other five. A little bit sooner than I typically expand up to that many, but it right, looks like our science ship has returned. So tell you what. I was just in the middle of saying that I will probably go ahead and just have this science ship survey these worlds, or these systems, because we've found so many habitable planets. Sirbin, unfortunately, is the first one I would like to colonize, but we're not going to be able to colonize it until we get rid of those marauders. And yeah, there's their strength. 303 is their battle strength. First fleet's only 197 right now. So we're going to have them chill out for just a second, because I don't want to make a move quite that rash. Okay, we just crossed the 400 mineral mark. 
which means that I can build an Auditon monument on Earth. Now, the only thing about building the Auditon monument that you have to keep an eye on as a new player is that, yes, this is one of the ways that you build unity early on, but notice what it consumes. It consumes consumer goods <laughs> in order to produce society research and unity, if you read that tooltip. So by building this, I'm going to cut my consumer goods output down pretty substantially, pretty quickly. So that's why I kind of paused for a moment thinking, all right, do I want to build another alloy foundry for my for this other building slot? Notice that it put them side by side. So now the, the civilian industries is here. This is the producer of, uh, as you can see, consumer goods. But that's the choice that you make with that first building slot. Do you expand your alloy production so you can build more ships faster? Or do you expand your consumer goods so that you can have more unity and more colonists faster? You can, of course, do both in a reasonable amount of time. But these initial decisions that you make playing a game of Stellaris can really influence the course of like the first hours of gameplay. And I do say hours of gameplay because like any good grand strategy game, a full game of Stellaris, especially on a massive map like this, it's going to take a while. Even just the end game crises take hours and hours, but it's fun. That's why we play. It's a story building up over time. Okay, so once this system's fully surveyed, mm, still challenging, leave B. Once these systems are fully surveyed, we can go ahead and expand into them. And I don't think that we even got that far. No, we didn't. There's still lots of Serban to survey. That's unfortunate. All right, let's go ahead and build another Corvette. I'm using the reinforce button, so the Sol station, which has one shipyard on it. As you can see here, one shipyard, one trade hub. And then, of course, crew quarters so that I can orbit ships around it. And their upkeep, their impact on energy is reduced. Watch what happens if I move these guys. See what happened to the income there? Governor has gained a trait. Oh, really? That's not a good start. Hang on. All right, so go back. I was just demonstrating how that changes. All right, so our governor on Earth, the core sector, Nyad, Nyadzeni Nkwai, or Nkwali, is already a substance abuser. So she is going to die 20 years sooner. But their current bonus is they're giving additional food from jobs. What other options do I have? I kind of like the idea of just hiring Conceda Giordano because she has better leadership or leader experience gain. Let's do that. I'll keep you around. We'll keep that other governor around. And there is, let me show you real quick. When we go to leaders, notice there is an upkeep. So I'm, I now have two less energy income because I'm keeping a governor around that I'm not using. Governors are sector based. So I need to have another sector set up before I can use that governor. And I probably won't use that governor. But point being, The point being that uh, she might be worth having around because it's just substance abuse is problematic, but there are detrimental traits that develop that are much, much more severe that impact, for instance, experience growth, their ability to learn anything new. So if you have a governor develop experience growth, um, there's one called stubborn. And I think there's, I think, yeah, it's arrested development is what it's called. And if you get arrested development, you're pretty much screwed in terms of gaining experience and you will not... If you gain that before you've gained any meaningful governor abilities by being in a, in a post for a while, you won't, there's just, there's no point to keeping that governor around. The discovery of alien life. The NSS Asimov has made a startling find in Alpha Centauri 3. The planet is teeming. Of course it is. Look at it. Look at it. With alien life. For the first time in history, we have encountered life forms that did not originate on Earth. This amazing discovery has silenced those who believe we were alone in the universe. Oh, no, it hasn't. We all know how this works. Flat Earthers exist. That wouldn't shut people up. Although none of the alien creatures found on Alpha Centauri 3 are sapient, it is only a matter of time before we encounter beings that are. So we gained 124 just lump sum society research, which let me show you how this works. Roughly. So notice this is a 2000 cost project. We just gained 124 and it's going to cost at our current rate of research 50 months to get from 948 to 2000. Not anymore. We're now 26 months away from that society boost. So I'm going to keep the game paused and we're going to stop this first episode here. That's a wonderful stopping point because we've just discovered 
our first colonizable planet. Well, we've discovered several, but we've just surveyed our first colonizable planet and we've acknowledged as human beings that we are not alone in the universe. Not a bad start. And especially with the narrative already developing with the Fellowship, that's a really interesting turn of events. And as soon as this first fleet is like at 350 or 400 strength, which it's going to be <laughs> very early in the next episode, then we're going to take out these guys in Sirban so that we can finish surveying that. And we are probably going to colonize the ocean world in Sirban first. So stay tuned. New episodes of the series are going to be coming out every day at 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Comments are always welcome, by the way, as well as questions, of course. So let me know what you think. Let me know if there's anything I can help you figure out. And I mean, especially with this first episode and the first several, there's going to be a lot of stuff discussed. But since we're not doing a formalized tutorial, if there's something that I gloss over or something that you're curious about, not only am I happy to help you, but the people in the community are generally happy to answer questions and help you figure stuff out. So leave a question down in the comments below. Again, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.